Um, I'm going to be showing you how to do the correlation Excel assignment here. We we'll talk about a little bit of correlation, what when you would use that. So, if you've taken algebra and you plotted a line, that's kind of how correlation works. So, this line will show how things are related. Okay, so if the like if we run Right now, I will run a um, a scatter plot, which is you'll have to do. So a scatter plot plots each individual data point um, with two different variables. So if I want to do a, um, if I want to do the amount of change in the exam score and study time and hours, and I want to check for 25 people, I would select the data it would give me this um, this scatter plot so this is changed so pretest to post test how many percents did this change um, this could be positive or negative so if the score uh, decreases there's a negative value here um, but this so all the positive values indicate a percentage increase this person here studied 16 hours, their original score was a 31, and then on the post-test got a 91%. So that was a 60% change, or 60 points change, however you want to think about that. Um, so this is checking how much does this variable change relate to how much they studied, right? So we have the points plotted here, and sometimes plotting those things makes it, you know, you, doesn't look like anything is there. Now, if we add a trend line, so you select um, the data points, and then you you can add a trend line. That's going to give you um, the indication because it takes it takes into account how far each of these points this is giving you the line of best fit which is this is the best fitting line for each of these data points this is the line that makes the most sense for each of these points now there is a um, there is actually a uh, uh, an assumption here that this is going to be a linear relationship so you can see when you pull this up um, for the trend line you can um, do different types of relationships. This not for this course. Um, so, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the different relationship possibilities are here. So we're making this assumption that there is going to be a linear relationship. So we assume that um, the study time and the change is going to follow this pattern, a linear pattern. Um, so the more this number goes up, the more this number goes up would be a positive. And then this number going up, this number going down would be a negative, which would be a line that is in kind of like going upstairs um, this way versus upstairs this way, right? So um, how, where is the slope of this line? Is it, um, are you, is the line going down or is the line headed up? So here where if we do a negative relationship, it's kind of like a downward, but a positive relationship is upward. So those are important things to know. Like when you're looking at these, um, correlation pat, it's hard to see this pattern. Um, sometimes you'll see a more distinct pattern. Um, let's see. I don't know how many points it's going to require for it to show up as a distinct pattern, but let's try something. So, uh, one... Okay, so we're going to just
much. Okay. So if I were to select these, so insert scatter plot, you can see that's, you know, pretty distinct. Okay. Even if, I mean, you don't need a trend line for this one, but this is very distinct on what it is. Okay. Um, that is going to show you a linear relationship pretty, pretty easily. Um, you're not going to see that as much in actual data. It's just not, most data is more messy and more varied, um, as the variation gets, you know, more intense, it's harder to tell what the correlation actually is. So that's why we are going to learn how to run these correlations. Okay. So I have this set up for you guys already. So once you get a correlation, you're going to just put the numbers in here for this correlation. I even have your sample size written out for you. So your sample size is 50. This says 51 because in the very first row there are labels. So you have 50 um, students here. Uh, just so you know, this is fake data. This is not real. So, um, but there's 50 students who took the pretest, scored, then took uh, after the end of the course took the post test and scored and then I took the post test score subtracted the pretest score to get the um, change in score and then this is how many hours they were reportedly studied for the the post test or whatever let's just say like final exam. Okay. So, um, but this is the time studying. So when we want to do a correlation, we're looking at, okay, what do we want to know? Um, so I have three questions here for you guys to run correlations. So to what extent is pretest related to post-test? To what extent is post-test related to the study hours? And to what extent is the change related to the study hours. Okay. So we have pretest and post test. So what I'm going to do is show you how to run the, run the data or run the correlation. And then, um, I can show you how to move the variables if you need to, to run the other correlations. Um, that was just an, an easy thing to do uh, because of the way it's set up but I will show you. So we go to data analysis. So you're under the data tab here, data analysis. You go to correlation, click okay. And then you have to fill in this information based on what you want. Um, and the downfall here is that they typically are going to need to be next to each other. So, you can move them around and it's not going to hurt anything. Um, I make sure if you're selecting the entire contents that you click the labels in the first row or it won't run. Um, and if you don't select the labels, make sure that's not checked because it will bypass the top row um, that you do select if you click this. And um, the output range, just leave that as a new worksheet. Um, and then, because really only, you only need the number, okay? So I am going to actually only go to 25, um, C1 to D25 or 26, let's just do that. So we have um, 25, uh, 25 observations and then click OK. It's going to pop up a new sheet. So this sheet popped up and it gives me the correlation right there. So 0 0.348. So when I, um, when I round that, 
it's going to be 0 0.35. So that's the correlation of study time and change. Not the one you are going to have to do because, like I said, I only use the 25. But let's see. So that would go um, change related to study hours. So we're going to put that here. Now I want to make sure that I change this to 25 and we're going to put study hours or uh, the correlation for the study hours and change at 0 0.35 and then it's going to pop up numbers. Okay. So this says um, the, so what this is doing is it's testing um, whether the correlation between the two variables is approximately zero or the correlation is not zero therefore it's a statistically significant correlation now just kind of like a clarifying statement here a sig statistically significant does not mean important does not mean large it just means that it's different from zero so based on all the information can you say that the um, correlation is not zero and this gives you that. So for this, um, it calculated a T. So here's the formula if you're interested in that. So it takes the correlation and multiplies that by, and this is formula I typed out for you guys so you guys don't have to, because if you did use statistical software in the future, that's more geared towards specific um, statistical values like SPSS or um, R, then the p-values are going to pop up. It's not going to expect you to calculate these yourself. So I wanted to give you that information because it's not, to me, it's not as important for you guys to learn how to calculate this because you can just Google this. Like how do you, how do you calculate a p-value in Excel for a correlation? And it will give you a formula to use um, so you don't have to, you know, uh, remember how to do these things. But um, the point here is that it, calculate a, it calculates a T-score and then it gives you the P-value. Um, the P-value here is uh, 0.08, uh, which would round here to 0 0.09. Um, and that is not statistically significant. Therefore, um, and likely this is the sample size. Okay, so the thing to remember about statistical analysis and p-values is that if you had a larger sample, it's going to take that into account. So if I had a, co or a correlation coefficient, and this is a Pearson's um, correlation, Pearson's correlation, so um, 0 0.35 as a correlation is, although in our smaller sample of 25 was not significant, if you had the same correlation in 100, it is statistically significant. So that just means that we had more um, support for this. We had much more data which means we're getting closer to the population. Um, so if you look at this, we're talking about like what kind of, with this kind of correlation, what, what would be our, um, the importance of the, the sample sizes? Like this is how you increase your power, okay? The power of finding that that information if it's there okay so this is why sample size is very important because the if you had and you saw how how much that increased just by five uh because 30 is pretty much a minimum that you really want um but if you increased it just two people it's going to pop up a statistically significant correlation. So even, let's see one person. No, that's that's um, not quite there based on scientific, um, the 
expectations for the p-value, so you'd need at least 32. And that's um, for this size of correlation. But the point here is that the reason that it is not statistically significant um, doesn't really matter at this point. It's just not. So um, for, let's say I did this study with 25, I would say, you know, I could not reject the null, I failed to reject the null hypothesis because this is not statistically significant. Um, and that does not mean that there is no correlation between these variables. It just means that I couldn't, in this study, I could not reject the null hypothesis. And you've, you can tell that it's because my sample size was too small. But um, you guys will have a larger sample because you're going to be using all of it. So you have 50. So again, all you have to do is pop the number in here, pop the correlation in here uh, for each of these pairs. Okay, so you have paired up the pretest score and the post-test score, the post-test score and the study hours, and the study hours to the change. So we'll go back to the data. So pretest and post-test are next to each other. And then um, post-test study hours. So maybe I can move this over so you guys don't have to move anything. Okay, so this should help you. So you will be running the pretest and post-test, which is this top one. And then you need post-test to study hours, which are the two middle. And then you're running study hours and change. So you won't need to move anything um, when running these. But what you're going to have to do is just pop these correlations in here once they pop up. Again, all you have to do is um, select all these to run your correlation. But I want you to run a... Um, Scatter plot, and you have to click the dots to add the trend line, and that's what yours is going to look like. Um, you can, I would change the name of this to um, relationship between study hours and score change because this needs to reflect okay if you copied this and pasted it somewhere it needs to be reflective of what this is actually showing you uh, because they don't label these line or these axes like they really should so um, it would be best if you would change this title to reflect what this is showing um, and then you're going to be submitting the figures separated from the um, the, ca the calculations for the correlation p-values but you also should just so you know when you're checking assumptions you're going to still check assumptions like any other time and remember that you you should by now know how to create histograms right here and do your box and whisker plot for outliers so you want normality um, you want to check for outliers remove any outliers that are there if they exist um, so if we check um, on so if we check the outliers let's see if I can just select that much I don't know if it'll pull up but it should okay so no outliers that we can see here you guys just cre you can create one box plot um, if you want to see I think I've showed you this before but if not if you want to see what an outlier looks like 
um, let's say the post test somebody accidentally types in this if the data is being collected manually you can see that there's going to be an outlier <laughs> so um, because I changed it for the post test it shows the change amount so we'd have to completely delete this um, this value for this course um, there are ways to to work with outliers um, and missing data or something like that um, differently but for this course you just delete it um, I'm just going to switch it back but if I want to just check for outliers in the full frame you have to click all the way down um, and then do your box and whisker plot so you're gonna have one figure that looks like this you need to rename this so it tells you it's um, checking for outliers in the data set or whatever um, but you're gonna have that figure you should have um, distributions for um, you don't I wouldn't do this one because this one is actually um, just a calculation between these two so if there's going to be a an out or a, a problem with these two there will be a problem with this one so you only need distributions for these three groups or these three variables okay so you pre-test post-test dead time so you only have um, the distributions for those three so you will be pulling the descriptive statistics so insert no not insert so data analysis descriptive statistics um, you will want the descriptive statistics for just the three labels in the first row if you select them only if you don't select them you need to do the you need to make sure that that's not uh, that's not selected but I select them because it gives you the names um, and then you could do the output range wherever you'd like but make sure you have summary statistics and it'll pop up for each of the groups and we'll have them labeled and everything so you're going to look at the skew and kurtosis for each of these make sure that there's nothing that stands out which it's problematic if it's um, plus or minus two uh, or larger of a um, of an absolute value so these look okay for where I selected um, I'm going to delete that for now again these are different because I didn't select all of the data you have to select all of it so and then once you calculate all your p-values you just stick them in here and it gives you the it, or once you calculate all of your correlations excuse me you stick them in here and it will pop out the p-value for you so what you're going to record in um, in canvas is I'm going to ask you um, the correlation and the p-value and if it's statistically significant or not. Um, you make sure in here the p or the correlation when you pop it up is going to say um, zero point blah blah blah, and you do need to put it in there like that for. Um, for the correlation in Canvas, I'll have the zero in front, um, but I will not for the p-value because the p-value cannot be one. Um, it will never be perfectly one or negative one. So 
correlation coefficient, technically it, it could be um, it could be one. That's the highest it could get in negative one, but you're gonna, never going to see that. So um, you still put a zero there, but it's I'm probably going to accept either way. Uh, it'll just be a matter of formatting in Canvas. So, but I hope that makes sense. So you, once you're finished, you're going to have the descriptive statistics for these three columns and you're going to have distributions for these three columns and then you're going to have um, your scatter plots with trend lines for this pair, this pair, and this pair and so you'll have the three different scatter plots. You will have a box plot with, um, I would just include these three as well since this was a calculated. So a box plot with just these three is fine. Um, I think that's it other than your, obviously your p-values and correlation coefficients and whether you're rejecting the null. I put the, these as like a generic, like this is what that's telling you. Um, it, again, correlation is its own effect size. Okay, so a small uh, correlation for Pearson is considered 0.2. A medium is considered 0.5. And a large correlation um, is considered 0.8. So the strength of the correlation is dependent upon the distance from zero. So a correlation, say a correlation of negative 0.8, that's a negative correlation that is just as strong as positive 0.8. The only difference is in the direction of the um, correlation. So, for example, if there's a correlation where the trend line is going up, that is a positive correlation. So that means that as we will, I'll, let me get one of these up so I can explain this a little better. Just this is what this will look like. All right, so in regard to this, you can see that first of all, this the scores for um, post test range between sixteen hundred. All right, but other than that, you see this relationship. This is a positive relationship, right? Now, because as this increases, so does that, right? So the further you go over, the further you're going up. And the same goes for um, like a negative relationship. The further, the further you go over, the further you go down. So if, if it went this way, if you're talking about the slope of it going um, in the opposite direction here, then you're saying as a student studied longer, their exam score fell. Okay, which doesn't make sense, right? So um, unless that also uh, relates to how much sleep they got the night before. So that we have to remember with correlations this is not a causal relationship um, this is this cannot be or cannot infer cause here because the only way you can infer cause is if you're looking at an experiment we don't have an experiment here so this is just a recording of what students would say that they studied 
and then their actual test scores. So this is not a controlled experiment. Um, therefore, we cannot infer cause. Um, and we have this situation for correlations called a, like a third variable problem. So we have these confounding variables that could be impacting this situation. So the, in the case where you see, like you would see a negative relationship in something like this, so the longer the student studied, the exam score went down, right? Or the longer students studied, the exam score reduced. But that could also be impacted. The reason might not be because they studied it might be because they didn't get any sleep the night before. So you can't just say, oh, okay, the longer you study, you know, the lower your score is, right? So that you can't make these um, inferences from something like this all the time because of um, these extra problematic variables that are messing around with our data, right? So we never really know with just a basic correlation. It gives you some information, but it's not as useful as you hear it to be. So you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, well, the correlation between these two is this. Well, I need to see that research and I need to see how, it, like, was this... Um, was there anything controlled? Like, what are we looking at? What are we actually looking at? Like, how did the, how were these things measured? Um, uh, was there any kind of control, you know, uh, within this to prevent these extra variables with impacting our results? So that's also something to really keep in mind. Um, because we could you know, look at uh, uh, if, it, if it did pop up a negative relationship, right? That doesn't make sense for how we know learning works. So something like that, you might have somebody make some big claim. Oh, no, studying longer actually reduces this, um, this post-test score. And that would be an improper inference. So, um, it's really important we also look at this as um, okay not necessarily right not necessarily does uh, even these this positive relationship even something we expect to happen just because it's a positive relationship does not make this a causal relationship here so um, we have to consider lots of information so we can't really infer cause even though it follows this pattern that we know um, is a good like method right so we know studying helps um, the study time though like might not be as important as the study method like there's a, all different kinds of variables that could mess around here so you have to remember you cannot infer cause even if it follows the projected, like what you expected. Um, you, uh, that's very, very important because most research is not experimental um, in, in human um, research because of there are certain things that you just cannot control. Um, so it would be unethical to control some things um, and experiments are very limited they need funding, um, they need participation. Um, so there are problems with that. We have a lot of correlational research, so you just have to be careful with inferring cause. Um, so anyway, I hope that, <laughs> I hope that me getting on the soapbox for a minute um, gave you guys a little bit more to think about as far as like even reading research. Um, but so, this is the limitations of correlation. You got to remember those. Um, it there are spurious correlations. Let me see if I can. Um, let me pull up. 
spurious correlations. Okay, spurious correlations. And you can see, so if you want to know, because I don't calculate p-values in, in this, but this gave me the formula you needed um, to do that. So I didn't have to um, type it out myself. And then here are um, the assumptions to make sure that you hit spurious correlations. Now, um, this is exactly what it sounds like. These are random correlations that were run. Um, they just kind of tell you, hey, this isn't... Like the you got it. You can't infer cause. You can't say something causes something else just because it's very strongly related. So, um, for example, this person, um, the popularity of the first name Johnny correlates over the years with burglaries in New Hampshire. So <laughs> that's pretty strong one too. You can see it follows very strongly. Um, you can even go through this website if you'd like. I'll put it in um, I'll put it in the assignment title or the assignment information so you can look at this but these are just crazy weird correlations um, that show you kind of like lots of different things can relate that that really don't make sense so like bachelor's degrees awarded in the liberal arts is strongly related with the number of pediatricians in Massachusetts. So, I mean, looking at this, R is very strong, but why would this be so related? Um, and think about it. So, the number of bachelor's degrees awarded in this area is strongly related to the number of pediatricians. And the, the obvious like third problem like third variable here is just that there's more people in college in general so as the number of bachelor's degrees are awarded the number of pediatricians in Massachusetts specifically that was just chosen but this could probably be in any state or um, many of the of the fields that are in need uh, because people tend to like to go for, for areas where they have a high need, right? You want to get a job. So this is going to be strongly related, and it could be any, like, lots of different popular subjects, like computer science or whatever, is probably going to be the same. So um, just because there's more degrees being awarded in lots of fields, right? So that could be the, the, the issue there. Um, cheddar cheese consumption correlates with solar power generated in Haiti. Um, it, it's just, some of these are just completely random, but you could think of reasons why they might actually make sense, right? Uh, Google searches for zombies versus the number of real estate agents in North Dakota. That, so that's kind of a funny one. But um, the point is, you have, you have these spurious correlations that um, pop up. And in reality, you know, these are just relationships. They aren't causal. So that's important to remember. And we'll get back to this. Um, so make sure that you have the histograms for each of these three, the scatter plots for each of these um, relationships, um, the uh, 
um, descriptive statistics for these three, and then all of the correlations and p-values for the three requested relationships and whether they are whether you reject the null or not. So it's important to um, get all of that information and you're going to have two different quizzes just like before um, because you get unlimited attempts on the one that's auto graded. I don't care how many attempts you take. Um, just remember the formatting of the numbers. And then as far as the figures, you're going to get two attempts because that has to be manually graded and it's just not feasible to give unlimited attempts for something that's manually graded. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps you. And um, if you have any questions, just let me know. All right. Have a good day.